Good afternoon. My name is Carlton Smith, and I'm very, very glad that you've been able to join us today to talk about a family and culture baseline, preserving uh, family, preserving a personal legacy. When, uh, when you're with Native people, they generally like to begin a program by introducing themselves traditionally. And today I have with me my namesake, Charlie James, and I'll tell you a little bit about him. Um, so it's probably more appropriate for him to introduce both of us because we have the same name. Um, he was a personal friend of Walter Soboloff. Many of you would know Walter. Um, they went back their, their origins in Kilsnu or in Angoon, uh, and then later on in life, Charlie moved to Kluckwan, where he was adopted into the killer whale uh, house in, there in Kluckwan. So it's appropriate for Charlie to introduce both of us, and it goes like this. He's just said, I'm recognizing my mother's people, my father's people, and the rest of you seated here. Just caught Juan. He's just introduced himself as an eagle. He's from the killer whale clan, the tall fin killer whale house in Fuckwan. So that's the proper introduction. Little change, little change. I'm going to set him down here because he's got a precarious perch. So preserving a personal legacy is, is personal. And what you're going to see today in sharing our knowledge with you about our family is very personal. Uh, with this introduction, I want to frame this uh, first by giving you an idea of how Charlie fits in. Shanakawa is his name. It means in the image of the ancient people. That is what our name means. Many of you have seen this book, Ha'ani. Uh, it was put together by these two gentlemen, uh, a series of interviews by uh, them in the late 1940s. And it's indexed by village. So actually, they do start um, with interviews uh, in Kluckwan. And the interviews were conducted by two native people, both from Angoon. Uh, the last name was Kaklen. And Joe Kaklen and his wife uh, did a tremendous job of interviewing uh, the villagers up and down the coast. One of those people that they interviewed was Shunakawa, Charlie James. And in this photo uh, of the 1929 um, A and B convention in Haines, when the decision was made to sue the government, Charlie James is among the founders of the original A and B. And in this inset, you see Charlie with a pronounced mustache, pretty much in the center of the photograph. And one of the individuals uh, that assisted us in identifying those who were in attendance at the 29th convention was Judson Brown, among others. So that's Shanakawa. Next, we have an image of traditional Tlingit country, which is a brilliant piece of work um, done 
by the late Andy Hope uh, of Sitka in, in collaboration with Peter Metcalf. And this is a broad view of Slinket country. And the next slide will take us down into more detail. So as far as Charlie's beginnings and my beginnings, they are at the top. You say, just Kut Kwan, just Kat Kwan, and of course, later, Haynes. Just Kut is distinguished from Chishkut because in the Chilkat area, we had glaciers where we could store food. Chilkut, on the other hand, did not have glaciers, and therefore the ability to amass wealth and store food was less pronounced. Again, this, this was work that Andy Hope put together. It's, if you don't have this map, and you're interested in Slinget culture, Haida culture, this is a dynamite document. It, is, it, it covers in detail, both on the Raven side and the Eagle side, the names of the houses phonetically spelled correctly. And many of them, of course, are still in existence today. What, before we go to this slide, I wanted to explain again that the, putting Charlie James in context, uh, he lived in the company of traditional leaders like Jimmy George, William Johnson, Isaac Katas, Judson Brown, A.P. Johnson from Sitka, Austin Hammond, Walter Soboloff, George Jim, and Frank Johnson we used to refer to them as the heavies. And this was at a time in my life, in the 50s to the 70s, when people throughout the region knew the key family relationships and the key clan relationships, and they had an ability to recall uh, clan names and their meanings up and down the coast. So what I want to do here is start with uh, the personal story of my family, which I pretty much had to reconstruct myself uh, over the years, and I'm still still working on it. But it began with my mother, who was born in Skagway in 1929. And her story is tragic in that her mother died uh, at her childbirth, and she, she was a, a tuberculosis victim. So she began as an orphan uh, in Skagway and, and was soon to be raised by her grandmother. And in this photo, this is, I believe, 1936 in front of the Skagway Presbyterian Church. And you, you'll see my mother dressed in white uh, to the left in the front of the photograph and then at the top of the photograph on the left is her grandmother, who she called Mommy, because Mommy raised her until she was eight years old when Mommy died. Um, there's my mother on the right. And there's Mommy at the top on the left. This is the only photograph of my great-grandmother that I've ever seen. Then when mommy died in 1938, uh, my mother was scheduled to be adopted by a Presbyterian minister in Skagway. And at the last minute, they decided they would not adopt my mother. So she went to the orphanage, the Presbyterian orphanage in Haines called Haines House. And of course, it was run by the, the uh, Presbyterian church. Uh, it was very... Um, military in style, a lot of discipline, a lot of hard work. And there she is to the right, uh, almost to the last row. And she was there for four and a half years, at which time she was sent to Sitka, uh, to Sheldon Jackson, uh, then to Heidelberg to stay with her uncle 
And then ultimately she went to Seattle where she attended uh, high school but never graduated. Here she is again, this is uh, taken in 1969. Um, she was divorced at that time. Um, she was stricken with schizophrenia, uh, lived here in Juneau for a period, was actually homeless here in Juneau for a period. And this f is my favorite photograph of her because she's smiling. And uh, this photograph was taken at her residence in, in the low income project called Holly Park in central, Wash or central Seattle. Here she is uh, toward the end of her life. Uh, she died two months after this photograph was taken um, and she died of breast cancer uh, at age 54. So today, uh, whether you have indigenous roots or not, uh, it's our observation that some people have the, hold the value of preserving their individual heritage, or they do not. Some are interested, some are not. <clears throat> At a 1981 gathering of elders uh, in the region, it was actually held in Sitka, uh, the elders that were gathered there told us that they wanted us, see Alaska at the time, they wanted us to do two things. They wanted us to preserve language and culture and foster educational achievement with our young people in the region. And the result of that was to create the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute, which formerly was the Sea Alaska Heritage Foundation. And it, of course, has been charged with working on culture and language. And we also created the largest scholarship program in the state at the time. The number one program in the state was ARCO, and ARCO distributed $10,000 a year. There were only 10 scholarships offered by ARCO. And Sea Alaska distributed $55,000 in the first year, which was a pretty big deal. Um, so that's, that was the beginnings of what we, know, what we now know as the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. That meeting also inspired this gathering that we have called Sharing Our Knowledge, the Klan Conference. Those elders said, we've got to do this on a regular basis. So this gathering came out of that initial meeting. When I was eight years old, and this is getting back to the family story, my uncle, who you see here, uh, Bill Matthews, uh, he was regarded as the mayor of Dye, where there was a native cemetery and also the slide cemetery in Dye. He was called the mayor of Dye because he personally took an interest in preserving these graves, including the slide cemetery graves. Here you see him leaning over the crib which he built for his wife and his two children um, after they, they too died of tuberculosis. What's also interesting about his story is that he actually built the coffins and, and placed them in the coffins and buried them himself. And this would have been about 1920. In this photograph, he's about 60 years old. Uh, Here you see a photograph of a reconstructed crib, the same graves that my family uh, embarked on this project um, in, in the late 1990s. And this was a project that my father chose to implement uh, at the request of my uncle. This is a slide showing the Taya River, which is in Dai. And you can see, if you look closely, next to, below the T, it says, danger, cold water, swift current. And there's a native cemetery, just very small distance below that point. And that was the cemetery where those graves were located. Might have skipped one here. 
No. Later on, there was a publication uh, done on this project, and it's been published by the Park Service. Uh, and I should have brought a copy with me, but if you're interested in that. So backing up, just, just to summarize, the family early on took a, an interest in restoring graves. My uncle said to me at age eight, Carlton, how would you like to work on this when you get older? And I didn't know at the time the scale of the project that was involved because we had six family graves in Sitka, we had four family graves in Haines. We had several in Skagway in the native cemetery. And then his mother was buried in the city cemetery of Skagway. So by taking on the charge, I was agreeing basically to be responsible for this entire project, which we have we've assumed that and assumed it in a positive way over the years. So today I want to share with you, again, it's a kind of a personal project I've had uh, to motivate my own children to become interested in preserving a personal legacy, preserving what's important to us as a family. And the topics that I've chosen for them to preserve are in four basic categories. By doing so, I, I've chose to avoid a situation in my own mind that when I'm gone, they're going to start asking questions that I should have been responsible to lead them to these answers while I was alive. Some of those questions could include, what was our grandmother's tribal name and our grandmother's birthplace? Where were the rest of the family members from? What did my father say that their traditional house was called? And what is the location of this tribal house? What makes it special? The tribal house that I'm referencing is the Keet Gushi Hit in Kluckwan. What makes it special is that is the only tribal house in Southeast that I'm aware of that still has a totem screen intact, 100% intact. And I see somebody clapping back there. That's a big deal, but it's also important to know it. <clears throat> and the final question they might have is, did our uncle really jump off the Juno Douglas Bridge and commit suicide? Well, the answer is yes. And why did that happen? Because he too was a victim of tuberculosis and had an unfortunate prognosis delivered by his doctor and he left his robe on the crest of the bridge and they never found him. So we call it today, we call it Uncle Cliff's Bridge when we go over the bridge. <clears throat> Next, I want my boys to have a sense of the Claims Act, the history of the Claims Act, the settlement itself and the entities that came before the act itself and that came after the act. Um, some of them, of course, in the beginning, the Alaska Native Brotherhood doesn't get enough credit for what those ladies and gentlemen did in collecting dimes and quarters and going door to door raising money um, to see this happen ultimately. Then, of course, Clinkett Haida Central Council took a huge leadership made a huge leadership contribution so that a statewide settlement could occur. Sea Alaska then came and village corporations. Uh, the, this wonderful thing we call 7i, which shows up in, in checks once in a while. Uh, then Sea Alaska Heritage Institute and then Celebration. And these are the entities that were spawned as a result of land claims history. Next, I would want them to at least get familiar with some basic language sounds and concepts. Place names, counting, colors, foods, other clan names, greetings, everyday phrases, and most of all, to me, feelings 
How, do you, how are you feeling about being a part of this? Next, I would want them to understand the context of their own clan membership and how they relate to other members of their clan and their opposites, people on the other side. You've heard that song, you're nobody until somebody loves you. Well, it's the same thing in the, in the Slingit culture. Your opposites, when they recognize you, that's what they're saying, they love you. So I'd want them to know their own name, their at, at u, the basic protocols involved, and a kuik. How does a kuik flow? We'd want them to know that. So what we've done here is just to take a stab at it, and this is by no means perfect, and I apologize if anybody is offended by this, but I've taken a, a shot at trying to communicate my history, and I won't read all this, but you'll see number five is my clan name, but that's also Charlie sitting here, Shanakoa. It's meaning the date of adoption, the person giving the name, there he is, Charlie James. My mother's name, C. Clain, which means big doll. And the grandmother's name, Mommy, who was born in 1861. And the current head man of the house is John Katzik. And I won't read these, I'll just go through, through them quickly. Now here is my oldest son, which you see he, here at the top, he's on the other side. He's a raven, he's a Gonak D. And you see number five, his name is A Na Wu. A Na Wu. Not Yes Na Wu, A Na Wu. Uh, his mother's name, Kagwone Teen. And you see number 11, meaning of father's name. What this is, is this just is an attempt to, and, and again, it's something I take responsibility for, it's an attempt to, to capsulize in one place for them um, the meaning of these things and how they fit together. Now this is my oldest son's uh, naming adoption. And you see this gentleman on the left there who's still very much alive. He's just rubbed the third one dollar bill across his forehead and my youngest son Kevin is behind him and this is important for them to remember again the context of who they are this is my youngest son we won't go through this out but you'll see number two his clan house is called the Ishka hit spring water house and his clan name is Yashkanda Etz that's how a sockeye swims in shallow water. Also, it's a sneaky tiptoeing. And they, the elders in Kluckwan still call him Sneaky Pete. This is, this is the two boys today. And my concern for them going forward is to ensure that they have a clear understanding of their history and their clan relationships. And without this, and this is a little bit corny, but without these clan relationships firmly planted in their heads, this, is, this would be like living in a country without citizenship. This would be like being without a passport. This would be like living in a house with no address. This would be like driving an automobile with no license plate. This would be like being a member of a family not knowing the country of origin where that family is from. So what I've done is developed basically a baseline culture test for them to take. And going back to those four categories, we've developed 120 questions in this test. And it also calls for short essays on some of the topics that I listed. And I'll just go through them quickly. A History of Anxa, it's a short essay of 100 words. Clinkett's Haidas and Simpsons. The key question is, how are they different? Okay. The role of Clinkett Haida leadership in accomplishing a statewide claim settlement act, 50 words. Formation of Sea Alaska, 50 words. The formation of village corporations, 50 words. 
Formation of the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute, 50 words. Are you listening, Charlie? And then, just a wide open question at the end, what binds this region of people together? Just a freewheeling question. What we've got today, thanks to Walter Soboloff, is we've got a kind of a 14-point manifesto of standards in the Slingit world um, that we live by. And there were other people involved in this, but uh, you see this very often, and it's pretty doggone good. And you know, these are the these are the kinds of values that we need to be able to share with our children that are important to us. So what I've got for you is the question, boy, this really sounds daunting, doesn't it? I mean, who would want to take this tough test? But it's important to our family to be able to pass on these values. And to motivate my children, I'm in a position, probably pretty lucky, where I've said to them, when you get the perfect score, and we scramble the answer sheets every time they take the test. When you get the perfect score, you're going to get 50 shares of Sea Alaska stock. And my youngest son is nearly finished with the exam. And he's always asking me right around fall time, well, I understand there's a Sea Alaska check coming out. Am I gonna get, am I gonna get some stock? So when he passes this test, he's gonna get 50 shares of Sea Alaska. So in a wrap-up question I have for you, what will be your legacy? Why is it important to pass on? Will it be lasting? So Charlie's going to say the final word. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't know if we have time for questions or not, but anybody willing to take that test? No? But I would encourage you to just think about uh, what's important for you and your children, if you have children. and. This thing uh, we call Slingit culture is complex. There's no doubt about it. And to the innocent bystander who's got an interest, uh, it's, it takes a while to, to pull it all together, um, but it's worth it. And uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>